Bibles with you this morning. Let's turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 7. John's Gospel, chapter 7, as we resume our study back in the Gospel of John. It's good to settle back into this Gospel and continue our journey through it. Today we're going to pick up in verse 37, only make our way through two verses but there are two very, very, and well, three verses really, but focusing in on two verses. Very, very important section as we see an invitation coming from our Lord and then a promise given to those who accept and come to Him in this invitation. So John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39, and as you're making your way there, I do want to just reiterate the video um, that we saw earlier considering the Lottie Moon Christmas offering because of our Christmas schedule and just being able, neglecting the emphasis before Christmas, we're going to continue taking up the Lottie Moon Christmas offering throughout the month of January. Every single penny goes straight to the missionaries. None of it's used for overhead, none of it's used for administration. It goes straight to the mission field. Every single cent. And, and so we are honoring the legacy of Lottie Moon who gave her life in service of missions. And so we remember her by giving this, this Christmas season going into the new year. So we want to continue to remember our international missionaries that are serving all around the, the world. Many of them did not see family or were with family during the past couple weeks. So you be praying for them as they begin a new year. Some of them are in very, very hard places. And so continue them in your, to remember them in your prayers. Today, John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. And just to, to remind you of the context, Jesus is at the festival the, of tabernacles or the Feast of Booths as it's otherwise known as. We saw in the beginning of chapter 7 that his brothers challenged him. His brothers doubted his identity that he was and is the Messiah. And they challenged him and by saying, if you really are the Messiah, then go to the festival. We see at the beginning of chapter 7 that Jesus hesitated and said, my time has not yet come. It reminds us a lot of what happened in John chapter 2 when his mother came to him and said hey they've run out of wine and he says what does that have to do with me so we kind of see that same thing but then Jesus goes secretly to the festival and he people began to see him and in verse 37 we're going to see that he makes his appearance public now so if you found your way to John 7 hear the word of the Lord verse 37 on the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of water flow from deep within him. Some translations say from within his belly. The idea is from deep within his being. Verse 39, he said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been given or, given or received, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you through your Son, we are so thankful for this invitation that we read from the lips of your Son that all who are thirsty, let them come to Him and drink. As we come to You this morning through Him, through His name, we come to worship You and now we worship through submitting our hearts and lives to Your Word. As we examine these short three verses, May you speak to us, give us ears to hear and eyes to see wonderful things from your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For many of us, getting water is no big deal. In fact, I've got a drink here to keep me in case I begin to cough, to help me to keep from coughing and 
it's easy for us just to go to the tap and get a cup of water or go to the refrigerator and get a bottle of water, stop by the convenience store and get water. But that is not the case for everyone around the world. If you've ever been to a third world country, then you've experienced the frustration of sometimes trying to get water. Um, several years ago, I was in the country of Guatemala on a vision trip with three other men, and we'd been traveling all day. And we had nothing to drink other than just a few sodas that we had packed with us. And at the end of the day, we stopped at this little tienda, and um, they gave us a bag of water, and we drank from a bag. And to me, that was kind of unusual. To those who were our guides that day, that was nothing unusual because they recognized that water was scarce, that water did, is not easy to come by for me. I thought, why didn't we just stop at any convenience store? Or why didn't we go to any tap and get some water? And that is the way it is around the world in most places. Water is very, very hard to come by. For us, it's no big deal. But in Jesus' day, it was the same. In fact, they drank wine because they were unable to drink much of the water. And as we come to this chapter, we must keep that in mind because if we just try to interpret these verses or think about these verses in our context, then it doesn't have the same meaning. But if we recognize that water was scarce and hard to come by, and if you wanted to drink a water, you had to do more than just go to the tap. You had to do exactly what the woman at the well did in John chapter 4, go to the well and draw your own water, then these words take on new meaning. At the beginning of chapter 7 and into chapters 8 and into chapters 9, what we have here is narratives that surround the Feast of the Tabernacles, the Feast of the Booths, which I mentioned earlier. In Leviticus chapter 23 and in Deuteronomy chapter 16, we find the liturgy or the procedure for this festival, which recalled the days of the wilderness wanderings for the children of Israel. God's people, as they left Egypt, found their way into the wilderness, being led by the Lord each day they were dependent upon him and the Lord constructed or gave them the directions to construct the tabernacle and all the festivals that go along with it. There were three festivals that the Lord subscribed to them and in fact in Deuteronomy chapter 16 we're told that there are three festivals that every male must sojourn to or they must make a pilgrimage to each and every year. The first one is the feast of the unleavened bread. The second one the feast of the weeks and the third one, the Feast of the Booths, or the Feast of the Tabernacles. And during this time, the children of Israel, or God's people, would camp out in booths, in tents. And this would remind them of the wilderness wanderings. As they set aside this entire week to remember the Lord's deliverance from the land of Egypt and guidance through the wilderness. And on the last or great day of the feast was the climax of the Feast of Tabernacles. The first six days of the feast, the priest would draw water from the Pool of Salaam, which is the south end of the city, and make his way up to the temple complex with a parade. People would be following him as he carried this water from the pool in a golden pitcher full of water. And as he made his way to the temple, he would go into the altar and pour out the water on the the altar. He would do this for six days. And as he was doing this, a shofar, which is this big long ram's horn, would be blown, and Psalm 113 to 118 would be read aloud in the in the hearing of the people. These are praises of thanksgivings, and they were sung to the Lord. They were not just read, but people would begin to sing these psalms as this procession was made to the temple. This was a time set aside for God's people to remember the wilderness wanderings, and that God God himself delivered his people. And on the seventh day, the great day, as the water was being carried from the pool of Salaam to the temple, it would be repeated not just once, but seven times. And while that was happening, we read in verse 37, on this last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up. Not only did he just stand up, but he drew attention to himself by yelling or shouting and crying out, saying, anyone who is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. To kind of set the context of what was on the minds of the people, I want to read from Psalm 114, which is what they would be singing as the priest made his way up 
right before Jesus would proclaim this. Psalm 114. Listen to what they would be singing. <clears throat> when Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people who spoke a foreign language, meaning they came from the land of Egypt, Judah became his sanctuary. Israel, his dominion. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why was it sea that you fled? Jordan that you turned back, mountains that you skipped like rams, hills like lambs. Tremble earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water. Now, if you were listening, several things should have uh, stuck out to you. First of all, we see that in verse 2, Judah, God's people, became his dwelling place, his sanctuary. That was our prayer a few moments ago. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary that is his dwelling place prepare me to be a temple and that's what the psalmist is saying Judah God's people became his sanctuary Israel his dominion and then we see that the Lord drove back the sea and then verse 7 tremble earth at the presence in verse 8 who turned the rock into a pool of water we're reminded of Israel's experience as they complained to Moses. They were saying, Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness when we were back in Egypt? We had things to eat. We had water to drink. Why did you bring us out here? They're already complaining against the Lord's salvation. And the Lord delivers them by providing water from the rock. Moses strikes the rock. He, did, he actually disobeys the Lord by hitting it. But he strikes it several times and water comes pouring out and the Lord provides water for his people, his people who are dying of thirst. And as the children of Israel are reminiscing and reminded, or being um, reminded of this time, Jesus stands up as we read in verse 37 and cries, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So my outline this morning is really simple. First of all, we see an invitation given by Jesus. An invitation in verse 37. We see the scope of this invitation. Look at what Jesus says, if anyone. Some translations say whoever. The idea is anyone who wants to come to me can. If anyone is thirsty, not if any Jew is thirsty, if anyone of Judah is thirsty, if anyone of Israel is thirsty, if anyone of the religious leaders is thirsty, but if anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. This is a global perspective. The scope stretches across the entire world. We're reminded of John chapter 4. Remember the Samaritan woman? Jesus' disciples were a little perplexed why he would approach a Samaritan, number one, and second of all, a woman at that why would he not go to a jewish male instead of a samaritan woman this outcast she was obviously immoral as well as we read in the narrative of john chapter 4 but jesus reaches out to her and says if you would knew it, who it was who would say to you give me a drink you would ask of me and i would give you living water christianity is the most diverse religion in the world now listen carefully. Christianity is the most diverse religion in the world. And what I mean by that, it, it involves people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is one reason it spreads so quickly. Because it crosses cultural boundaries that no other religion can not cross. You can spot a Muslim woman by her dress. You don't spot a Christian woman by her dress or her outfit. You spot a Christian woman by her heart. Her heart has been transformed by the gospel. You see, there's something unique about Christianity. It is a transformation not from the outside in, but from the inside out. 
That's why it's so diverse and the person in China can become a Christian without stepping outside of their culture. We can become a Christian right here in North Carolina without stepping outside of our culture. That's why you have Christians who wear cowboy boots like me. You have ca- uh, Christians who are hipsters like all are, all are surrounding us in Raleigh. You have Christians who are from or multi-ethnic, who speak different languages, who look different, who talk different, who are different on the outside, but they're same on the inside. And that's why Christianity is so different. That's why we have so many problems in some churches when people get upset over music, contemporary or traditional hymns or bluegrass or this or that. It's because we have cultures clashing because Christianity brings people from different cultures together. It's so diverse, but we're the same on the inside, even though we look different on the outside. And that's what Jesus is saying here. If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me. So when you when people trump up diversity in our society and say we need to be more diverse, the only place that is truly found is inside the church. The scope of this invitation is to anyone. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. In my yard, there is a Bradford pear tree, and to me, it's good for nothing other than breaking, the limbs breaking. If you have one, you kind of know that experience. As soon as the ice comes, those limbs that are very weak will break. They produce nice flowers for about two weeks out of the year. The rest of the time, they're annoying. But that Bradford pear, is, to me, is useless. I would like to have an apple tree in my front yard because I would like for fruit to be produced in my yard. I can go down to Food Line and buy bags of apples and go out there and duct tape apples to that Bradford pear tree all day long and it will never become an apple tree. The only way for there to be an apple tree in my front yard is for me to plant an apple tree. See, there are a lot of Christians who think they can just change their appearance or change their morals, change their actions on the outside, things they do, and they can become a Christian. They can duct tape this nice deed here, and they can duct tape this offering there. They can duct tape church attendance there, or they can duct tape a tie and a suit there, and they become, can become a Christian. But they are no more a Christian than that Bradford pear tree is an apple tree in my front yard. The only way for them to become a Christian is for them to have a heart transformation. And that is only accomplished by Jesus changing their heart as they place their faith and trust in him, believing that he died on the cross for their sins. And they submit their life to him. They say, I can't do it on my own. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I believe that he gave his life for me. And I give my life to him. His penalty, his punishment on the cross paid my penalty, what I owe to the Lord. No amount of church attendance, no amount of good deeds could ever make you a Christian. You do good deeds because you are a Christian. An apple tree produces apples because it is an apple tree. It produces fruit because of what it is at the root. Jesus says, all who is thirsty, let them come to me and I will give them water. Look at the object of the invitation. And what I mean by that is those who thirst. This blanket invitation is given to all who thirst. The metaphor is referring to those who long for something, those who desperately need something, those who want something. It is a deep thirst of the soul. Christianity is about our passions. It's about our wants. It's about our desires. The problem with most of our desires and wants is that they're twisted. They're perverted. They're going the wrong way. They're not being satisfied in the way that they've been created to be satisfied. And we are only satisfied when we give our lives to Jesus. Ways, there are many ways that people try to quench the thirst of their heart. Materialism. They try to satisfy the thirst by going and shopping or buying things because they think if they can just get enough stuff, if they can accumulate enough stuff, 
then they will be happy and satisfy their heart. But shopping is just can be just like a drug. It feels good for just a little way, a little while, but as soon as the new wears off, they want to go out and buy something again. Or maybe people want to check out or check out of reality by numbing themselves by watching movies or TV. It's this escapism that we're trying to numb this desire within our hearts, our longing for something. Or entertainment. We look to entertainment to excite us, to give us a new thrill. Or maybe work. We try to outrun the thirst that we're experiencing in our lives by working ourselves to the bone. There is a deep, consistent longing in every single person's heart for purpose, meaning, hope throughout all of life. And that is one reason so many people in our society are so melancholy, so depressed, so discouraged, because we're trying to fill that thirst with something other than what can truly satisfy it. It's like trying to quench your thirst with soft drinks. If you've ever tried to, you may be on a hot day and you're, you're thirsty all day long and you think, well, I'll, I need to quench my thirst and you drink a soft drink. What happens a little bit later? You're thirsty again. The only thing that can truly satisfy you is water. And the, many reason, the reason many people don't see Jesus as satisfying is because they're looking in the wrong place to satisfy their thirst. They don't see Jesus exciting enough and so they'd never try him he doesn't seem like he would satisfy him so they don't pursue him they don't listen to him they don't submit their life to him there is nothing else in this life that works than satisfying your life other than Jesus this is the reason there are so many people in our culture who go through a midlife crisis they think this job will satisfy them they think having doing this hobby will satisfy them and then they get to a certain point in their life they're thinking I regret my life I've what am I doing? I'm wasting my life. And they have a midlife crisis. The only way to avoid that is by giving your life to Christ. So we see the invitation, all who are thirsty, and the promise in verse 39. It is the gift of the Spirit. The Spirit is a person. You can grieve Him. The Spirit is a person. You can hurt Him. This is not something like Star Wars, the, the impersonal force, that the it that's out there. But the Holy Spirit is a person. He resides in each and every one of us. He was given to the church at Pentecost, we see in Acts chapter 2. And this is the prayer that we sang a few moments ago. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. A sanctuary is a dwelling place of God. It is the temple, the tabernacle, where God sets up residence. Every single person. If you are a believer, you are a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 to run from sexual immorality. Every sin a person who that every sin a person commits is outside the body. On the contrary, a person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is the sanctuary? Other translations say, don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own you were bought with a price therefore glorify God in your body maybe you've heard someone say it's my body I can do whatever I want to with it no it's not this is my life I can do whatever I want to with it not according to scripture number one you did not put air in your lungs to breathe you are not making your heart beat you are dependent upon the Lord and if you are a born-again believer a child of God then you belong to him you've been bought by his blood whether you're a teacher a banker a farmer a car salesman a pastor whatever you are you belong to God you are to give his, your life to him. 
You've heard me say this before that we have been indoctrinated or ingrained with this idea of we get to choose what we want to do with our lives. Because we ask our children, what do you want to be when you grow up? Instead of asking them, what does God want you to be when you grow up? So we see the gift that Jesus is promising is the Spirit. He will dwell in you. And we see John telling us, John's giving us pretty good theology here. He's explaining it to us. He said this, verse 39, about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit. So John is, is saying, he, he, he's writing after Pentecost, thinking about before Pentecost. And he's saying, Jesus was telling us after Pentecost, after he ascends into heaven, we will receive the Spirit. He will be with us. But he had to tell it like this because this is before his ascension. So Jesus' gift to us is a person, the third member of the Trinity. And there are many benefits of the Spirit. First of all, the Spirit is the one who is sanctifying us, making us new. Sanctification is just that fancy word for God making you perfect. He's making you a saint. He's cleaning up your life. Because the reality is, none of us are perfect, but we will be someday, thanks to the work of the Spirit, not our own work. The Spirit is guiding us. He's that internal GPS. You know, if you've used your phone or GPS to go somewhere and you go a wrong way, it'll tell you to turn around. Maybe you're, you're headed down the road and your GPS is telling you to go straight, but you decide to take a right. It's going to say, no, get back on the road. Go straight. Or if you take a left and it says and you're supposed to take a right, it's going to tell you to turn around, take a right. The Holy Spirit is that internal GPS. You can block it out. You can ignore it. You can go the other way. But He is a gift to us, guiding us, convicting us, teaching us, giving us wisdom. And He is never wrong. Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul tells us, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. Notice he's saying, don't fight against the desires of the flesh. He just says, walk in the Spirit, and you will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. And this is what Paul says. You want to do these things that are according to the flesh. But if you walk according to the Spirit, then you're not going to commit these sins according to the flesh. He goes on to say, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, and he lists them. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Paul goes on to say, I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he says, verse 22, but in in contrast to what I just said, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Paul says you put those desires to death. They're asleep. They're gone. They're behind you now. Why? Walk in the Spirit. And notice what he says. These are not fruits of Bradley. These are not fruits of William. These are not fruits of Harold. These are fruits of the Spirit. It's not you producing these fruits. It's King Jesus producing these fruits through the Spirit. So if you're having trouble keeping your temper, then rely on the Spirit. Trust the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Too many times we just try to grit our teeth and say, I'm just, I'm going to do it myself. And then we get all discouraged when we fall into sin. 
We fall into gossip. We fall into complaining. We fall into slandering someone else. We fall into thinking about thoughts we should not think about. That's the fruit of Bradley. That's the fruit of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit, contrasted with that, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If any of you are thirsty, if any of your hearts are dry, if any of your hearts are frustrated, discouraged, hopeless, then come to Jesus. Let Him produce these fruit through you. In John chapter 4, the experience of the woman at the well, Jesus turns to the woman, the Samaritan woman, and says to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. He's talking about the water in her bucket that she had come to drink with. He says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. If you were to drive up to the offices, Steely Hall at Southeastern, there is a fountain out front. Sometimes there's not much water in that fountain because of this time of the year, because of the cold, the freezing. But if you go in the hot days of summer, that, that fountain's going around the clock. Every so often, there's a crew that has to go out there and put water in that fountain because that, wa that fountain is just cycling the same water over and over. Every little bit, you have to go stick a water hose in that fountain and add water to it because water evaporates. And if you were not to add water to it, it would eventually dry up. But if you were to go to my grandpa's house down in the woods, you're going to find a little cement building. You pull the top off that little building and you'll see a pool of water. It looks clear. It's very, very cold. And it's bubbling up continuously around the clock. 365 days of the year flows out of that building and down into the creek. That's a spring. And that's where my grandpa gets his water from for his house. Around the clock, that spring is flowing. Never runs dry. And he gets his water from there because that is a source of water. He doesn't go to a fountain that's just cycling the same water over and over. But he goes to a spring like Jesus describes here. If you come to me to drink the water that I give you, the life that I give you, the satisfaction that I give you will last for all eternity. It'll last longer than the newness of the new clothes you go and buy, the new shoes you go and get, the new pocketbook, the new hat, the new truck, the new fishing boat you get. It will last longer than that movie that you escape from reality by watching. It will last longer than any of your friends that are around you. It will last longer than your job, retirement, hobbies. It will last for all eternity. There is nothing else that will satisfy like Jesus. If you have never trusted Him, give your life to Him. You will never experience the peace and the hope that only He can give unless you give your life to Him. You will never have a heart transformation unless you give your life to Him. Let us who are believers remember that the fruit that we long to give in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, is the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of our lives. Let us continually Come to Him and drink. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as I come before You thinking about these verses, I am sure that there 
is someone in a room this size, someone here who is not a believer. They've never trusted you as their Savior. I pray that you begin working in their heart to show them their true thirst, show them reality, their need for you, and the fact that you love them. I pray that they would hear this invitation that you are proclaiming, come, you who are thirsty. And for the majority of us here this morning who are believers, we confess that our, our water does run dry. Our hearts gets parched at times. We get discouraged easily. We pray that in the midst of our valleys of life, in the midst of the dr- deserts and the dryness of life, that we would find refreshment in you. Holy Spirit, may you stir our hearts. May you produce your fruit through our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.